یکی بود یکی نبود گیر از خود در هیچکی نبود Long ago when there was no one but God A stone fell from paradise and landed in the middle of the desert It was called Sange Sabur the patient stone And for countless nights without moon, without stars, the patient stone cried out to the empty nighttime sky, when will I be touched by the moonlight? When will I be touched by the moonlight? And then a night came where the sky was scattered with stars and in the middle of it was a moon that glowed like a silver disk. And one of its moon rays touched the patient stone. And the patient stone became so filled with this bright light, it thought it was going to burst as it shook and shook and shook. And in the middle of the shaking, it opened an eye. And this is what the eye saw. It saw a girl, a young girl called Manzar. And every day before going to school, she went to the well in her backyard, there to do her ablutions. And every time she looked into the well, within the well she saw an old woman with a kind face and tender large black eyes a face framed by a black chador. And the old woman from the well reached out from the well with two hands, two hands of glass, reached out for the girl Manzar, saying this again and again, Har payani sayeye agazi de garast. Every end is the shadow, the shadow of another beginning. Harpayani sayeye agazi de garast. And every time the old woman in the well said these words, Manzar always replied, Bale Aziz, yes, grandma, I know that this is true. Now one day, her mother had given Manzar a beautiful hijab, a beautiful headscarf of bright blue satin that shimmered in the sunlight. She couldn't wait to put it on before going to school and showing it off to her friends. And proudly she walked out of the door of her home. But that day, that day there was a fierce wind that was blowing. <sighs> And as she walked to school, the wind tugged at her headscarf, tugged at it so much that it pulled the headscarf from her head. And she started chasing after it as the wind blew, blew it away further and further. <sighs> there it went fluttering in the wind like a bright big blue bird. But she kept chasing it and chasing it so far away that her school friends cried out to her, Manzar. Manzar, you will be late for school. But still she chased after her headscarf as was being tossed by the wind. <sighs> she chased it out of the gates of her own town, and there beyond it was a desert. And tumbling over the sand dunes, she chased for her scarf as the wind kept blowing. <sighs> and as she ran, she saw emerging from the desert were these walls, these walls that had an opening of a gate, a gate of rotting wood that was opened. And there was the wind that was tossing that scarf right through that gate. <sighs> and there was Manzar chasing it right through the gates to, to what was beyond. And once she passed through the gates, finally she caught her headscarf. But when she turned around, Those gates were closed behind her, and she was locked in. But 
at that moment, she saw where she was, a beautiful garden surrounded by trees covered in orange blossoms that shaded the desert sun. And in the middle of that garden was a pool of clear water, water so clear like the tears that come from a broken heart. And surrounding that pool were rose bushes, rose bushes filled with the song of nightingales. When she looked around further, she saw beyond the gate, there was a wall, a wall with seven doors. Each door was locked with a big, large gold padlock. She went to the first door and she touched that padlock, but at its touch, the padlock turned to dust. And so she opened that door and beyond that door was a room, a room filled with diamonds and rubies and jewels, all the treasures of the world. And then she went to the door right beside it, touched that gold padlock, and at its touch, it too turned to dust. And when she opened that door, she saw a room filled with bales of silk and calico and carpets from Keraman, Tabriz and Kashan, the most finest things to be found in the whole world. And door after door was the same thing. Beyond each door, beyond each door was its own treasure, its own treasure that Manzad had never ever seen before in her whole life. And finally, she came to the seven do seventh door. And beyond that door was the most wondrous thing of all. For in the room beyond that door, there was a bed, a bed of green silk. And lying on that bed was a handsome prince with a face like the moon, a perfect straight nose, and lips like red sugar. And he was wearing a turban, a turban of bright a turban of bright green silk. But alas, he was fast asleep. At first she didn't know what this meant. But then she saw at the foot of the bed there was calfskin, a calfskin on which was written in gold letter the following. Here lies the prince Hakikat, a prince who has been asleep since the beginning of eternity. But if you sit at the side of this prince and talk to the one who cannot reply to you, console the one who cannot comfort you, if you could do all this for 40 days and 40 nights, you will win the love of the sleeping prince who lies before you. And so Manzar sat at the bedside of that sleeping prince. And she said to him everything, everything about her school, about her life, about her most stray thoughts. She talked, talked as much as she could but as the days became weeks, she ran out of things to say. And there were long days of silence, silence that preyed upon her. And that silence she could not bear any more. She tried to shake the prince awake, saying to him, Araste, a handsome one, please but say a few words to me to console my weariness. Prince was deep in his sleep, and she was alone with that silence, a terrible silence, a silence so terrible she could not sit in that room anymore, and she ran out into the garden. But there the silence was worse, for it seemed like the walls of the garden were beginning to move towards her as if to crush her, and her ears were ringing, ringing with that silence that she couldn't bear anymore. And that silence was playing tricks on her mind. 
She thought she was hearing things. This very strange sound. She didn't know what it was. And then she heard footsteps from the other side of the walls. And then she saw a rope that was thrown from the other side of the wall into the garden. And down that rope into the garden, there climbed down a girl, a girl from a desert tribe. And she was wearing anklets, anklets of bright gold and bracelets of silver. And a lit necklace of countless gold coins. She had large, warm brown eyes. And when her smile, when she smiled, her teeth, her teeth glowed like bright white pearls. John, it's John. Hello, dearie, said the girl. My name is Sarab, and I have come here to console you in this terrible silence. Well, when Manzad heard someone else speak to her, she had not heard a human voice in days and weeks. She ran to Sarab and embraced her and told Sarab everything, everything about her including what she found in the room beyond that seventh door, the sleeping prince, Hakikat. And when Sarab heard everything, she smiled at Manzar with her bright pearl teeth. Dearie, you must be so tired. Go, go now into the room where there are the soft, Kashani and Tabrizi rugs, and rest there for a while, and I will take your place at the side of the Prince Hakikat. And indeed, Manzar was so tired that she took this offer and went to that room where the soft rugs were and fell fast asleep. How long she slept, she did not know. She just remembered when she woke up. And when she woke up, her first thought was, I have left the Prince Hakikat alone in that seventh room. I must run to his side. And so she ran out the door of that room. But before she could make it to the seventh door, there was Sarab, now in fine silken clothes and pearl earrings and all the finery of a bride. Servant girl, servant girl, said Sarab to Manzar. Servant girl, get to work. Manzar couldn't believe what she heard. Sarab, don't you recognize me? I am your friend. Servant girl, servant girl, get back to work. And as they spoke, she saw from behind came the Prince Hakikat. He was awake. And his large green eyes were looking at her. And he, she saw in those green eyes that the Prince didn't recognize her. And then she understood that she would be, her fate was to become the servant girl of Sarab. And so she took a pail and rags and began to polish the bright blue tiles of that garden, of that palace in the desert. And then began, then began a period of long, endless days, long, endless days of toil, Long, endless days of people whispering behind her pat back and she having to pretend not to notice. Long, endless days of people hurling cruel words that cut like daggers at her and she forever having to pretend that they did not hurt her. Long, endless days. 
long endless days of toil and heartbreak. And that was the life of Manzar. Now some time passed and the prince called before him his wife Sarab and his servant girl Manzar. And he told them that he was going on a long journey and he asked them what gift they would have him bring for them from that faraway place. Sarab was the first to speak. Husband, she said, husband, bring me back a jewel box of bright red lacquer. And then Manzar was about to walk away. But the prince cried out to her, Eh, Manzar servant girl, you have not told me, you have not told me what gift I should bring for you. Manzar turned to the prince Hakikat and said this, Master, Master, if you remember, bring back to me Sange Sabor, bring back to me the patient stone. For I know if I have that stone with me, it will console me for many years. And so the Prince Hakikat went on his journey. He did his business in that faraway place. And at the end of it, he did not forget to go to the market and buy that jewel box of bright red lacquer for his wife, Sarab. But he was about to leave the city, and only then he remembered what his servant girl asked him. And so he returned to the market and asked the merchants there, Bebachid, excuse me, good sirs, but you know where I could find the patient stone. At that, at those words, the merchants began to laugh at the prince. What do you want with that foolish thing, that plaything for old women? Don't waste your time looking for that. But the prince pleaded with them. Please, good sirs, tell me where I could find the patient stone. For someone has asked me for it, and I cannot bear to return to her empty-handed. Very well, said one of the merchants. You see that alley at the end of the street there? At the end of the alley is an old woman. Everyone says she has lost her mind. She sells all these foolish things. Perhaps with her you can find the patient stone. So the prince went down that dark alley. And at the end of the alley he found her an old woman sitting crouched against a wall. In front of her was a blanket, a blanket that was covered with all these strange different trinkets, broken toys and broken bits of glass. And her hands were forever in her sleeves and she kept rocking back and forth, back and forth, saying the same thing again and again. Harpayani. Every end is the shadow, the shadow of another beginning. Excuse me, Hanum, excuse me, dear lady, said the prince to the old woman. Excuse me for bothering you. But would you happen to have the patient stone? Well, at those words, the old woman stopped rocking and she looked right, right into the eyes of the prince and said to him, August, sir, do you know what you ask for? The patient stone isn't just for anyone. The patient stone is only for the one who has the strength to bear it. But the prince pleaded with the woman, Please, Hanun, please do not refuse me, for somebody has asked me for the patient stone, and I do not have the heart to return to her empty-handed. 
Very well, said the old woman. But you must promise me this. To whomever you give the patient stone, you must not be far away from her. For indeed the patient stone can destroy the one who does not have the strength to bear it. Well, the prince made his promises to the old woman. And then and only then, the woman removed one of her hands that was hiding in her sleeve. It was a hand made of glass. And with that hand of glass, she picked a stone that was on that blanket. And when she held it in her hand, it seemed like that sto stone was floating in the middle of the air. And she gave it to the Prince Hakikat. And after many days' journey, the Prince returned home. And there was his wife, Sarab, waiting for him. And with a broad smile, he gave her that jewel box of bright red lacquer. And Manzar was about to walk away, but he called out to her, Manzar, I have brought what you have asked him of me. And so he handed to her the patient stone. Now once the patient stone was in her hand, she held it close to her chest and she ran to a faraway place at the end of a corridor where she could be alone. And beyond that corridor was a, was a courtyard, a courtyard where she was there all alone. And she held that stone, the patient stone, and she started speaking to it. And she told the patient stone all her years, all her years of back-breaking toil, all her years of disappointment, all her years of heartbreak, all her years of hearing lies that she had to pretend were truths, all those years of seeing injustice she had to pretend was justice. She told the patient stone everything, everything she had suffered. And not far away was the Prince Hakikat who followed her. He was hiding, so Manzar would not notice her, but he saw everything, heard everything she said to the patient stone. And with tears running down her cheeks when she said everything she had suffered, everything she had suffered when she said all these things to the patient stone, she started speaking to it and asking it, Sangi Sabur, patient stone, you have heard everything that I have suffered. And now I must ask you, I must ask you, who is the more patient? Who is the more patient of us two? And then the patient stone began rattling in her hand. And a voice that sounded like it came from the bottom of the barrel started speaking to Manzar, saying this. After all, after all, I, I am the more patient of us two. What? cried out Manzar. What? And she thought she was fainting. And as she went into a faint, she dropped that stone to the ground. But from behind there came the Prince Hakikat, who caught her in her faint and held her in his arms, and rocked her back and forth, saying, Eh, Manzar, oh, my dear one, the patient stone lies, for indeed you, you are the more patient one. You are the more patient one for suffering every, you, everything you have suffering everything you have for me. And when the patient stone heard these words on the ground, it rattled, became full of light, filled with so much light that it was beginning to burst. When it burst, there was this bright light that was all around, so bright that the prince had to cover his eyes. When the bright light passed, he saw there was Manzar in his arms and her eyes were opening and looking straight into his green eyes 
And at that moment, Manzar saw that the prince recognized her. And the prince smiled to her, saying, Eh, hey, Manzar, you, you are my true wife. But when Manzar heard these words, all she could reply was, But that is impossible, for Sarab is your wife. And then she released herself from the embrace of the prince and ran down that corridor, crying out again and again, Sarab, Sarab, where are you? Until she understood that that bright light had chased away Sarab forever. And then there came that night, that night which was Manzar's own wedding night, she was sitting in front of the mirror, painting her lips and her eyes and her eyebrows, doing everything to make herself beautiful for her true love, the Prince Hakikat. And then she saw in her black hair there were strands of silver. She said to herself, I must paint those silver strands in my hair as well. And she, she reached for that brush of black paint to paint those silver strands of hair. But before she could do so, a hand caught hers. It was the hand of the Prince Hakikat. And he turned to Manzar, smiling to her, saying this, My love, my love, please do not paint those silver strands in your hair. For do you not understand, do you not understand that that silver, that silver is your reward for many years of patience? And Manzar smiled at her husband and released herself from his embrace and walked out into the terrace. And when she walked out onto the terrace, there was a night a nighttime sky scattered with stars. And in the middle of that sky was a moon that glowed like a silver disk. And she could see in the starlight there was a blue bird that was flying towards her and rested, rested on the, on the railing of that terrace. And the blue, beautiful blue bird turned to Manzar saying this, Har payani sayeye agazi de garast. Every end is the shadow, the shadow of another beginning. And at those words, Manzar turned to that bird, saying this Yes, beautiful bird, what you say is all too true. For tonight I understand that patience is the garden. Patience is the garden where every beginning grows. And the bird nodded to Manzar and flew up again into that nighttime sky. And at night, that night could be seen across the face of a moon the shadow of a blue bird, the shadow of a blue bird flying towards eternity. Bala raftim mastbud, bayin amadim tohbud, yeseye ma dorohbud. Like yogurt is from milk, and old was once new. Many lies I have told you, which in the telling come true. <laughs>